So, hello. Uh, <laughs> how was your night last night, huh? Um, I'm not going to say it was a hard test, but it made all my hair fall out just writing the darn thing. Um, yeah, I know. I put a lot of myself into every one of those exams. If there were any beard shavings in your test, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to grade the exams this weekend. And as soon as I can, I will make the grades visible so that you can see how you did. Um, we're going to use this digital system so you'll be able to look at the exam on the web and see the points and see what you did and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully we can get that information to you as soon as possible. I will also try to get you information as soon as I can about curves. Are there going to be a curve? Is there going to be any kind of adjustment to the scores? Um, you know, I need to know what the averages are before I can tell you that. So uh, as soon as I can, I'll get you that. It should be this weekend, probably Sunday-ish, you should know. Uh, yeah, question. Where will we find these grades and the scans? Yeah, I'll send you an info with, in the email with the link or something. Um, I'll send you a link to, wh to where to go. <clears throat> uh, yeah, but I don't know anything about that yet because I haven't done the grading yet, but, you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, if the scores are too low, I'll curve them up. You know, it's going to be okay. We'll figure it out. I'll post an answer key this weekend and so on. Um, there's some kind of group that's like sending email us out about like a support session that they're trying to run. Did you guys get emails about this or something? There's like a, oh, they're like, like three to four or something? there's some kind of meeting that they're doing where they want to get people together to vent about our midterms or something. And <laughs> they were, they were trying to ask me if I would like tell you guys about it or something and advertise their thing. I don't know if I wasn't, I just got this email just before I walked over here. So I didn't have time to really look at it, but it seemed a little weird for me to be be like, hey, guys, did you hate my exam? <laughs> if so, go over here. I, so I don't know. that. I, I just want to make clear, like, I don't have any affiliation with that event, and I just heard about it, so I don't even know if I have an opinion about it or not, but I just wanted to make it clear that that's not a departmentally sponsored activity. Um, I think that's, that's the only thing that I can say with any certainty about it. Um, but look, I guess, I guess what, I, what I would say is... Uh, Let's get the scores back before we like form all of our opinions about everything. I think a lot of times people do better than they thought, or maybe the curve fixes the concern that they would have had about the score. So let's let's talk about it once we know how we all did. Okay? So that's all I have to say for the moment about the midterm. I also I will add I appreciate that you guys. I know that this is a hard week. I know you guys are working hard. I appreciate that you're here today. Uh, those of you who are sitting here in the room, I appreciate that. That's that's nice of you. Sometimes the day after exam, the room is a little empty, but Feels like we got our usual core of people here. It's cool. Um, so, okay, you know me, we're moving on. We're not gonna dwell on the past, we're moving onward to the future. Uh, I will confess, the website is wrong in a small way. Uh, we're not gonna talk about binary no. trees today. <laughs> sorry, sorry, we're gonna do it on Monday, yeah, we are. But uh, I just, I couldn't get into the website to change it, but we're gonna talk about what's on the slide deck here. We're gonna talk about arrays and templates, which I think is also cool, so. Um, Anyway, yeah, uh, that's where we are. Uh, homework five got posted just before the exam. Uh, you need to make time to finish that by the end of next week. So go check that out. That's a link list and pointer uh, focused homework. So, um, okay, let's go on to the new stuff and talk about arrays a little bit. Some of this comes from chapters 11 and 14 in the textbook. Again, we're part of a large unit of material that's about implementing data structures. And we did link list. And now I want to talk about arrays, things like vectors and, and some of these other kinds of collections are implemented using arrays. Arrays are not that hard, and you've probably done arrays plenty, so I didn't want to spend a lot of time on them, but we're going to do today's lecture on them. Okay, so uh, here's how to declare an array in C++. You write the type, and then the variable name that you want to give the array, and then you write square brackets and indicate the number of elements, the length of the array. This is not quite the same syntax as Java. The Java syntax looks more like this. Array name equals new array, and you put the length. So this probably looks familiar to some of you who did Java before. Um, but there's two syntaxes for declaring arrays, depending on whether you want the array to live on the stack or on the heap. We already learned about the stack and the heap, right? And the stack memory is going to be in your function. When your function is done, the memory is thrown away. The heap memory is off in some cloud somewhere, and it doesn't go away at the end of your function. So depending on how long you need the array for, you have to pick which one of these you want. Um, this is a simpler syntax for a stack. Once you allocate it, that's the size that it's going to be forever. 
When you first initialize an array, the contents of the array are random garbage. So all these seven elements are not set to zero. They are set to whatever was the, in the bits of that memory before. So you have to be mindful of that. If you want them to be zeros, there's ways of doing that, but it's not going to be zeros at the start. Um, this version allocates an array on the heap. The behavior of both are the same. They're both arrays. It's just that this one will stay after the function is done. One small difference about the syntax is that in Java, you would have said type bracket bracket name equals new type, right? In C++, you say type pointer name equals new type. So this is kind of interesting because what C++ does here is it allocates exactly the amount of memory that will fit this many of this type of thing. So if an int takes up four bytes and you ask for an array of 10, it will allocate 40, four times 10 bytes, and it will return the memory address of the start of that chunk of 40 bytes. So it's literally just an address of where those 10 things are stored. So actually, if you talk to C programmers, they think pointers and arrays are the same as each other, or that they're very similar to each other. And that's kind of where that comes from, is because an array is just a brick of memory. And if you have a memory address at the start of that brick, you can go there and put things into the chunks. And so that's kind of the idea. Uh, I saw a hand up, yeah. Um, what is the type of the stack allocated for array? Is it still a pointer, technically, even though we don't declare it as one? Is this a pointer? Well, I mean, this kind of array and pointer similarity is sort of there. Like, if you say homework grades, bracket zero with this or with this syntax. What you're saying is follow the pointer and then move forward by zero in its worth of memory. So if you say homework grades bracket three, it goes to the homework grades address and it moves forward times three times the size of an int to get to there. So that would be true of this or this. So technically, if you just refer to homework grades without a subscript with either syntax, you're technically, that is a that is the memory address of the star. It's technically a type int pointer. Yeah. But, you know, Mostly, I want to avoid using pointer syntax with arrays when I don't have to use it. Um, that's more of a thing. Using pointer syntax to do array stuff is more of a C thing. If you're doing C++, you don't have to do that as often. Uh, but let's not speak of regular C programming here if we can avoid it. You can, you can suffer through that in some other class, some other day. Um, OK, well, yeah, yeah, some other class. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, uh, this one, just like with link nodes and all that stuff, this one is one that would leak memory if you didn't free it up later in your program. So you have to be mindful of that. The other advantage of this syntax is that if you make an array of a certain size, and then later you decide you want a bigger array, now arrays are never resizable, but you could make a bigger array, like 20 instead of 10, and you could tell this pointer to point to the bigger array instead of the smaller array. And so now you essentially have a larger array than you had before. Even though the old one, the old one didn't grow, it's just that you pointed to a new one that was bigger. You know? So those are the syntaxes for declaring an array. And of course the context here is we're gonna make a, a we're gonna implement a data structure that's based on an array, so we need to know how to declare one. Uh, so here's a quick picture of stacks and heaps and stuff. So here's a function. I declare two ints, I declare a stack array, and I declare a heap array of the same size. And so the sort of vague picture of the memory is that you got x and y. This is on the stack here. You got x and y, and a is also on the stack. When you allocate a2, a2 is really just a pointer to an array in the memory. And when you get to the end of make arrays, all of these things go away, but this doesn't, right? Um, yeah. And, and actually, one thing maybe I didn't say very well was the syntax for accessing the elements is the same. So like if you say a1 bracket 0, that goes here, it's 42. If you say a2 bracket 0, that goes here, gets a 42. You don't have to say like star a2 bracket 0. The, the brackets imply follow this memory address, follow the pointer. That's kind of implied by that syntax. OK, so that's, that's the syntax of an array on the stack and on the heap. Um, I talked about how the elements are garbage when you first declare the array with either syntax. There is another syntax where you follow this by putting parentheses, and that tells C++ that you want to zero out the elements. By default, you might say, why don't they just always zero out the elements? The reason is because C++ is a language built for speed, and if you don't need them zeroed out, then they don't want to take the time to walk across and zero them. Zeroing out memory takes O of n time to zero out n elements of something. So they don't want to do that if you don't need that. Other languages like Java and Python made the opposite choice. They said, well, 
this leads to bugs to have garbage values. And so we're going to zero everything out even if it makes our program run slower because it's safer. Yeah? Can you use this syntax on a static, a stack allocator? I think you can. We can try it in the Qt creator. Um, I, I don't think I've tried that syntax recently. It, and we're going to make a stack out of an array. That's what our program has here. But if I do int bracket uh, int a bracket four, and then I do c out uh, a zero is a, or how about if I do a for loop, right? For int i equals zero i is less than 4, i plus plus, and then let's just see what's in there. A uh, i is plus a i and or and something like that. So just to illustrate the garbage being in there. Oh, I have to wait for this whole stupid thing. Oh, God. <laughs> Why? Why? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, I'm pretty sure that that will print garbage values. The real question was just whether I could put the parentheses on there. And we'll find that out in just a second. But... Okay, let me jump back to here in case there's anything else I want to say here. One thing, if you, so if you do use the parentheses and then you print the values out, there will be zeros instead of garbage, right? So you're welcome to use that. Oh, so there's the garbage. We expected that. I see your hand. I'll call you in just a second. Um, so we expected that to be garbage, just random numbers basically in there. Um, and then if I, if I say parentheses, it doesn't like that. So now how about instead if I say int pointer a equals a new int for parentheses, then that works and it prints zero. So yeah, I guess it's only with the heap. I'm not quite sure why it doesn't let you do that. I could just loop over them with a for loop and set them all to zero. Wait, somebody else had a question in the back? Yeah. Could you replace um, within the parentheses the empty space with some number? Would you initialize everything with that number then? Like oh, can I pass uh, like 94 and then they're all set to 94? I don't think so. You can do, um, there's a bracket bracket syntax. I think you can do like, uh, I think you can do that. And then it sets the values to that. Yeah, I guess that should be on the slide. I didn't really put that. Now actually, um, if you were doing the stack allocated one into A4, I think you can use that same syntax there. And then that comes out. Yeah, so the bracket bracket for the values, you can do that. I don't, I don't know why I didn't include that on the slide yet. Yeah. Stack Overflow claims that if you just leave those brackets blank, it'll set them all to zero. Oh, so if I just go like this? Yeah, maybe so. Let's try it. Ooh, cool. I like that. Very cool. Everyone's learning today, including me. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I don't know every corner of the language syntax. There's a lot of weird stuff that you could do, and the behavior is sort of mildly surprising sometimes. Um, anyway, whatever. There's lots of cute things that you can do with arrays. Yeah, question? Can you do for each on an array? Like for int n in the array a, see out n, endl. So I guess let's put some elements in here. 95, negative 17, 0, 45. You do print out the elements. Yep. So you for each loop over an array? Yep. OK. Can you for each loop if it's a, if it's a pointer, if it's a heap? Uh, I think so. Int star a equals new int four with those elements. <clears throat> uh, oh, it doesn't like it. Yeah, it doesn't like it. It's looking for something called an iterator with a begin and then whatever. So yeah, <clears throat> I don't often do for each loops over arrays, but the, the one thing that I, I will say about arrays, you know, why do we wait this long? It's like the end of the sixth week of the class and we're just talking about arrays, you know? Why do we wait so long? I think the short answer to that is arrays really suck in C++. Um, we've been using vector wherever we would have wanted an array because a vector mostly behaves in sensible ways. Like, if, if here, here's a fun one. See how I have four elements? Watch, watch this. See out a7 endl. What's located there? Oh, sorry, it's a, there's another error from before. But what's located in element seven? Apparently zero. Because in C++, you can walk off the end of the array all you want, and no problem. Hey, you want to see something really fun? Uh, int x equals 555, int y equals 777. Let's print a negative one. 
Oh, it's zero. Well, what about negative two? Sometimes if you like goof around with the subscripts and stuff, let's do like int a four with those elements. What's a negative two? Hey, it's five, five, five. Hmm, why is that? What's a negative one? Hmm, it's seven, seven, seven. What can we conclude from this? You're walking past yeah? the variable Yeah, that the memory address of this is right after the one of this and right after the one of that. So if I go to that address and I go backwards by one int worth of memory, I get to there. <laughs> There's a really funny bug. Can I waste two minutes of class time? Is that okay? You guys have never nodded so violently. <laughs> yes, waste two minutes. Okay, watch this. Uh, I think this will work. Void foo int x equals 4, int y equals 5. Okay, fine. And that's it. And then I'm just, I stop the function, right? So now I have no. void bar int a, int b, c out a, end all, a equals a. I think this will work. I, it doesn't, it's not consistent, but I think it'll work. And then b, and then b. Okay, so I have uninitialized variables, right? And I'm printing them, so it could be any value, right? So what if I do foo bar, and then let's do return zero. So it won't do that other code. What will happen? Oh, it says A is uninitialized. So actually, the problem is I have a warning flag set in my uh, build, so it will, um, wait. I, so I've locked this down, so it won't let me do this. Uh, what's the fastest way I could fix this? Uh, Uninitialize. See, I set this flag in our project so you can't do this because I don't want you to have these kind of bugs, but let's, let's live dangerously. Okay, so now it's just a warning. <laughs> Probably shouldn't print that. Don't tell me what to do, Dad. You're not the boss of me anymore. You understand what's happening here, right? I call foo, it allocates those variables, it sets the values of them, then foo returns, so the memory for foo gets taken off the stack, it gets sort of thrown away, but it doesn't actually go scrub any of it out, it just sort of marks that memory as not being in use anymore. The, the bits that were in there are still in there, so the, the, the value four is still one inch from the start of the top of the <laughs> next stack thing or whatever, but then when I call bar, bar says, well, I'll make a stack area for myself. And it makes it in the same spot that foo used to be in. And it doesn't zero out anything. And so what was in those bits is still in those bits. And that happens to be what it put is x and y. And so when I come in here, it happens to set a and b to the same like offsets that x and y used to live at. And so when I print them, it prints the four and five. OK, so anyway, isn't this a stupid language? Come on. I know it's kind of funny and stuff, but man, come on. Uh, so, okay, anyway, back on task. Let's talk about arrays some more. So yeah, sometimes you have initialized values and sometimes you have garbage values and you have to be careful. Look, I'm old, I've gotten sick of all these bugs and I like simple things that are predictable, so I kind of like zeroing out my memory, but maybe that's just me. So um, let's talk about how some of the collections we've done, how they work. A vector and a stack, I've mentioned this a long time ago that basically what they do is they have an array inside and they have extra space in the array that's like bigger than the number of elements that you've added, right? And then if you run out of space, you grow to a larger array so you have more. So that's a general idea. You have an array, you keep a size and a capacity. The size is how many elements the client has actually added in. And the capacity is how many spots total we have available for adding more elements if necessary. Uh, one thing about arrays in C++ is they don't actually store their size anywhere. So if you have an array and then you want to ask, hey, array, how many elements do you store? It has no way of answering that question. There's no dot length or dot size or dot anything. Arrays have no functionality. They're just memory. They're just a chunk of memory equal to the size of your element times the number of the elements. That's it. There's no methods. There's no size field. And so you can't ask the array for the size. You actually have to keep a variable uh, somehow uh, remembering the size. I saw a hand up. Was, did, I, did I trample over your question? Was that what you were going to ask? The size? Yeah, okay. Uh, your question. Uh, if it doesn't vary the size, how, how does it do like the four D? Oh, 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 yeah. Um, that's part of why earlier I didn't want to get into it, but I tried to write a for each loop down here, and it worked on this array, 
but it didn't work on the heap one. And the reason it worked on this one and not on the heap one was because it's able to look at it and see that it's got four here, but the heap one's just a pointer and it doesn't know what it points to. It doesn't know how many elements it points to, and so it's not able to tell how many loops to print. So yeah, that's kind of related to why it didn't let me do that for each loop. So, but the reason it was able for this one is that it kind of can look at the, the stack and stuff and figure out the size. But anyway, whatever. You can't figure out the size in general. But this concept of this, we call it unfilled array, is underneath a lot of different data structures that are built on arrays. Okay, so what I want to do with you guys is I want to write a class called array stack. Just implement a stack real quickly using an array. And it's not meant to be that hard, but I just want to play with arrays, so that's the excuse to do so. Push pop peak is empty and a printing operator less than less than, okay? And um, we'll have an unfilled array. We'll start with size 10, length 10 for the array. So if you come to the Qt creator, I've got a file called arraystack.cpp and arraystack.h. We've been learning how to make classes and stuff. So I want a constructor and a destructor. And I want these methods right here. I haven't written the prototypes for them yet. So uh, maybe for now we're going to store a stack of ints. So maybe you could say void push int n and then int pop, you, you pop off the top element, and then int peak, peak is looking at the top element but not uh, taking it out, right? Um, bool is empty, right? And then the operator less than is um, this thing here. Yeah, maybe we could make it friends, friend there, <laughs> friends with benefits, you know, that all that stuff. Uh, okay, so now what are the member variables? Well. We need an array, I already said that. Is it gonna be the stack style of array or the heap style of array? And I guess it's confusing wording because we're making a stack, but there's a difference between the data structure of a stack and the memory location called the stack, right? So I guess what I'm saying is should I write like int a 10 here or should I write like int star a here? Like which one of those is better or does it matter? You say in star? I think the first one. The first one? Because then you don't have to manage getting rid of it. It'll go away. I don't have to get rid of it? There is an answer that works better, I think. I think in general the, uh, the pointer, the second one, is better. You're, what you say is totally true. If we allocate it this way, then it doesn't require as much new and delete and managing the memory and stuff, and that's absolutely a, a valid comment. But there is a pretty major problem with doing this. This won't work if we need more than 10 elements. Like if we want to add an 11th element, there's actually not a way to do that with this. It's unchangeable, right? The benefit of using the pointer syntax would be we could start with 10, and if we use all of them up, we could make a new array with 20, copy everybody over, and then point to that. And now we have an array of 20. And because of that one reason, that's basically the only reason why I think we need to use the pointer syntax. If we didn't have a problem, if we only uh, needed 10, then this syntax would be better. But because of that, I think the pointer is what we have to go with. So I'm going to call it uh, elements instead of A. We also need to keep track of the size of the uh, array. And we need to keep track of the length of the array. Like, but those two terms are kind of confusingly similar. So sometimes I like to call this the capacity. Because that's how like, long the array is. And the size is how many times they've pushed. So there's, that's the difference. The size should be less than or equal to the capacity at all times, right? Okay? Like in my picture there, right? The array is the pointer to this. The size would initially be nothing, but it would grow as they push, and the capacity would be always a right? Okay? So those are our um, members. Now let's go to the CPP file, and we need to write all of these things with bodies. So. Uh, the CPP file has <laughs> nothing inside. Um, I'm going to have to switch these to have curly braces, right? Instead of semicolons. Uh, like that. Like that. And uh, what else? Sorry, slow. Like that. And like that. And like that. Okay, what else do I need to change about the syntax here? Yeah, I need to, in front of all the method names and all the members, I have to say array stack colon colon, right? Because I have to tell the compiler that these are members of a class and not just global functions. So I have to do that. That's a little bit annoying. Um, in peak and is empty, like that, right? 
And I'm going to eventually have to write this operator. I don't have a heading for that yet. So let me just copy and paste that down here. OK, cool. So let's just start at the top. Let's start at the constructor. When you construct a new array stack, whenever you have any constructor, you're supposed to like initialize all the private variables, right? So let's do the array last. Let's do the size and the capacity first. What's the size of a newly created stack? Size is the number of elements that it's containing. None. What's the capacity of the stack? I guess we'll start with 10. And then what's the elements array? What's that set to? A new int array of size 10 or size capacity, right? Like that, right? OK. Good. We're all set up. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, you could put the little parentheses so that it'll zero them out. I'm very cool. That's one of the only cool things about me is I always zero up my memory. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, in the dot h, are you actually switched to the order of your uh, declarations? Mm -hmm. but does that matter? It doesn't really matter. I just moved them because then I was like going to initialize them in that order. So. Um, I think it would be completely fine to do that. It does matter in the sense that in the memory, it really will lay them out in that order. Okay. But I will never be walking through the memory in that way in my code, hopefully. So it doesn't matter to me in a practical way. Um, OK, so I've got my elements. I've got my size. I've got my capacity. By the way, I just want to point out, back when you're doing Java, people get in this habit of like saying you know, equals 0. or equal, you don't, you, C++, you really can't do it that way. You have to declare everything here. You have to set all the values in the other place. That's why one of the reasons why I think in, even in Java, we kind of tell you guys to declare and initialize your, your members in different spots. But OK, whatever. So now we're set up. Um, the destructor here is when the stack is thrown away, when it goes out of scope, we have to clean up after ourselves. So like in general, if you just have normal fields like size or capacity, you don't need to say like delete size or delete capacity, like ints like that just get cleaned up. But the array, since I said new and put it on the heap, that one does need to get cleaned up. So you need to say delete elements like that, delete the array that we, that we allocated here. But just to make it more fun, you have to say delete array elements. <laughs> There's a separate syntax for deleting arrays. What? Why is it separate? Because arrays are just pointers. And so it has trouble distinguishing between, is that a pointer to one int or a pointer to a bunch of ints? And to distinguish them, you say, well, it's an array. And then it goes and looks up some internal data and says, oh, I know how many bytes that is. I know what to so do. It does keep the size then. Somebody does, but not in a way that, that we can tell us. <laughs> I know. I, listen, man, I'm not advocating for this language here. This language sucks. Yeah, somebody knows the size, but they're not telling you. Yeah. So anyway, you have to say delete bracket bracket. Okay, so now we've got, we kind of got the bookkeeping set up here. So now let's push elements on the stack. Do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Why do you have these brackets again? Because I thought all this was just a blanket. It's expected by the language. I'm not sure if I totally could answer you in a satisfactory way. Like somehow in its internal bookkeeping, it is helpful for the memory management system to know that this pointer is really the start of an array as opposed to just a pointer to n int somewhere. Because okay. an int star could point to just an int or it could point to the first int out of an array. And that can be hard to distinguish between those two things otherwise. And this bracket bracket here says, I'm deleting this int pointer. It's the start of an array. It's not just four bytes. It could be more. So I think that's why it needs to know it. I think if you leave the bracket bracket off, it is bad. <laughs> I think bad things happen and the memory doesn't get cleaned up properly. OK, so uh, push. Push means add to the stack. Of course, it's really not a stack. It's really an array, right? So basically, we need to go to an index that's available and put the thing in there, right? Um, in my picture, when I push these three, I put them in like that. I guess that implies something about the ordering here, right? Because a stack is more vertical. It has a top and a bottom. So where's the bottom of the array? Zero and the top is size or n or whatever, right? So I guess it raises the question of like, was that, does it matter that we chose that or could we have done it the other way? Is it better for the top to be the right or does it? Would it be just as good for the top to be the left? Or what are your thoughts on that? Somebody haven't called yet. Yeah. Well, if the top were on the left, then you'd have to push everything over every time you wanted to add something, which would be O of n. Yeah, remember that stacks are supposed to be fast for these operations, like pushing and popping, right? 
And if you add things to the end of an array, you can just go ahead and do it. But if you want to add something to the start, you have to shift everybody over. All of the adding and removing that we're going to do is on the top of the stack, right? So let's make the top of the stack be the place where it's cheap to add stuff. You understand, like, adding here is big O of 1. Adding here is big O of n. We have to shift. So let's not add at the start. Let's add at the end. Let's add, make the top be the end. So if you want to add something, if you want to push something on the stack, that means that you want to go to the first available index and put the element there. How do you know where that first available index is? Like here's a picture where I have some elements. What's the index at which you should put the newly pushed item? It's basically the size. Yeah, if you have three elements, they're in index of zero for two, so in index number size is the next one, right? So go to elements bracket size and set that to n. What else do we need to do? Size. Yes, yes. Ooh, yeah, that's actually a really good point. If the size is at least as big as the capacity, then I don't have any room to fit this, right? Like if I already have 10 elements in here, so I'm just going to write myself a good old fashioned to do on that one. <laughs> I, I definitely want to fix that, but I want to come back because that'll take a little bit of fixing, right? So assuming if we're here and we do have space, we put it there. So we went ahead and put a fourth element right here. Is there anything else we need to do in our code? Increase size. We have to increase size, right? Because now we have one more item. So uh, size plus plus, right? In fact, if you want to be really cool, you can put your plus plus in here, right? But whatever, I won't do that. I'm not that cool. Um, Capacity minus, no, no, capacity is not an indication of how many available slots there are. It's the indication of the total number of slots. Total doesn't go down. Okay, so that's pushing, right? These are all meant to be simple operations. A stack is fast. That's because the operations are simple. So push does that. Now we do, um, let's do peak before pop. So peak is look at the element on the top of the stack, right? So I'm going to return the value of some element from the array. What's the index of the top element? Size minus one, yeah, that's pretty good. Is there any cases I might not have thought about here? If there's no elements. If there aren't any elements, right? Like what if the stack is empty? We, haven't we have not written is empty, but we'll write it in a second. Throw, oh shiz, whatever, I don't know, something. Like throw an error, like that's an error case, right? We shouldn't just do this, because as we just saw a few minutes ago, that'll just grab random garbage from the memory nearby oh, the array. Right. Let's not. So that, that won't throw an exception necessarily. We should throw an exception. So OK, is empty. That's just return if the size is 0, right? So that's pretty easy. Um, OK, uh, pop. So pop has the same aspect of like you're not supposed to be able to pop from an empty stack. So maybe I will, oops, what did I do? Uh, Maybe I'll put that same sort of if check. You might want to make a helper function out of that. But OK, so now pop is basically the same as peak, except we have to delete the element as well as returning it, right? So I mean, basically, you grab it out of the array and set it aside. And so you do like uh, int result equals elements bracket size minus 1. Or you could even say equals peak. And then size minus minus, and then return result. Um, one thing we didn't do here was like imagine if we are grabbing out this guy to return, right? So then we decrease size to two. We could come in here and zero him out, right? We could say uh, uh, element size minus one equals zero. So what that would do is like if I'm if I'm popping him, I grab him out into a temporary variable called result. I zero him out. I set size to 2, and then I return the 17 that I saved aside as a result, right? That all seems fine. I do want to point out, though, we technically don't need to zero out this thing. Do you understand why that is? Like, if I increase the size to 2, and I just leave them there, <laughs> like, how can I get away with such a thing? I promised you I was going to pop this element off, but it's still sitting in there. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer here is like there's a difference between the internals of the structure and the external view of the structure. Like that 17 is still there, but if they try to pop, they don't get the 17. The next time they try to pop, the size will be 2, so they'll get this guy. So from the client's perspective, the 17 isn't there, or at least not in a way that they would ever see it. 
If I have two elements and I push, it would just clobber over the 17. So if I can't see it when I'm pushing and I can't see it when I'm popping, it's not there to the client. So you don't actually need to zero it out, you know? So uh, that's an interesting wrinkle. It's fine if you do want to zero it out just to help you with debugging or something, but it's not actually, like if you were really, really trying to write this fast for speed, you know, you would just not zero it out. That's kind of the C++ way is to just leave some garbage. In fact, in the very start of the program where I zeroed out the whole array, I don't have to do that. I could just delete these parentheses right here and just let it all be garbage. If size is zero, I'll never let you look at any of the garbage. So who cares, right? It's kind of an interesting uh, wrinkle to this, you know? So, okay, I think I'm mostly done. Uh, I don't have the printing operator yet. Let's just write that real quick. Now, since the printing operator is best friends with the stack, it can see inside to the internal array. Unlike any of the other code, it is allowed, or in, unlike any client code, I mean, it's allowed to see the internal array. I mean, the, the template for printing something is you put curly braces and then you put the elements separated by commas. And like, I feel like I've written that code a lot of times. It's just sort of a fence post thing. Basically, what you do is you say out, curly, and then somewhere at the end you'll say out other curly, and then you'll say return out. That's always going to be there even if it's empty. But then if the stack that is passed in isn't empty, then you print the elements. And the elements are printed like with fence post with a, with a comma between them, right? So you would do like uh, um, uh, out stack dot elements zero and then for each subsequent element, you'd put a comma plus the element. You know what I mean? For in i equals one, i is less than stack dot size, i plus plus out comma plus stack dot elements i. There. So I think that works. Now, if I went a little fast through there, I mean, basically, this one being outside and then starting at one is so that I don't have a comma before the first one. It's a fence post thing. And the syntax of stack dot elements is because this function is technically outside of the stack class. So I'm referring to the stack, I'm reaching inside of him and using his private variables, but I'm using it in an external syntax because this function is not inside the class. Okay? And I move up to size. Does that make sense? And I'm printing to out, which is whatever output stream this operator gets called on, which is probably gonna be C out, but could be something else. So I just wanna go test that real quick. I've got this testing code set up. Oh, uh, Hmm, interesting. This thing takes a const array stack and it doesn't let me call is empty because it's saying you can't call is empty on a constant stack. So we have made code that is not fully const correct. Do you understand? Like this printing operator, he promises not to modify the stack so he says I'll leave him constant. But when you promise not to modify the stack, that means you're only gonna call const methods on the stack. And we don't have any const methods, so it won't let us call any methods. Which methods should be const? Yeah, is empty doesn't change anything. And peak also, it returns, it looks at the data, but it doesn't modify it, it just hands you the value. So that's const as well. Push and pop obviously modify the stack, they're not const. Okay, yeah, now I think if we compile. Why does it give you a light bulb? Light bulb? Uh, I don't know, is it gone? Oh, there? What does that say? Oh, is that because, so the um, H file and the CPP, CPP file have to match. And if you make one of them const, you need to make the other one const. So I think in peak it was supposed to say const here. And in is empty it's supposed to say const here. Um, okay, so I think it's working. All these warnings are in that client code, all that goofy stuff we were doing earlier with this crap. So uh, what I really wanted to do, here let me comment out this stuff that's not related to what we're currently doing. Uh, comment out, all this. Okay, what I really wanted to do in main was this stuff right here. So let me pull that up a little. Paste, and I hear Slack messages coming in, that's great. Uh, there, okay, so what main is supposed to be doing is make a stack and push some stuff and print the stack. So I push, 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 and I print between, and then I pop, 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 and I print. So I'm just trying to test these methods, okay? So let's try it out. So I push and I get 42, that looks like the elements I added and then as I pop them off I get the 88 and then I get the 17 and then I get the negative 3 and then I get the 42 and then it's empty. So I think it's generally working. So I mean I wasn't really picking this as like a super super hard thing to implement but I wanted to show you like implementing a 
uh, data structure whose internals were based on an array. And you know, it is important to remember how to you know, free up all the memory when you're done using the, the stack. I could put print statements to verify that it's calling that or whatever, but I, I think I'm gonna save the time from doing that. So just what we've seen so far, bless you. Do you have any questions about um, arrays or about implementing a structure like this based on an array? Yeah? Um, so for incrementing the capacity, whenever you reach 10 elements, oh, we never mm -hmm. would it be more effective to just add 10 each time or to increment it sort of based on magnitude? So once you have 10, you add 50, after you're at 50, you get to 100, then 500, then 1,000. So you don't have to increment every 10 if it's like a huge stack. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, well, let's talk about that. So he's asking, how much should we increase by? So actually, I should apologize to her. She told me to resize, and I just I like abandoned her idea for like 20 minutes and never came back to it. So let's fix it, right? Um, if we don't have any space to add this thing, let's make a bigger array and use that going forward. But if we make a bigger array, we have to take the contents of our smaller array, and we have to copy them over. So that looks something like this, int bigger equals a new int array. Now this raises your question of how big should the bigger array be? It should be some size that's bigger. Well, you could do like capacity plus 10, like it holds 10 more. He's saying, well, I could do plus 50. It could be capacity times 1,000. It could be a lot of different things, right? Um, without going into detail, I'll tell you that it's very important that it be a multiple and not just adding. Adding plus 5, plus 10, plus 100 is not good. You want times two or times five, you want times. And the short version of why that is is because that makes sure that uh, you, you increasingly don't run into this as often. And if you're making a really big structure and you have to resize it and copy it every 10 elements or every 50, then building a structure of 20 million elements will really kill you with all those copies. So doubling or tripling or something like that is much better to, you get to a, bigger, a better big O where it doesn't hurt you as much to do these resizes in the first place over time. Um, so the, by far the most common thing is to double the size in a context like this. So that's what I think we should do. Um, so I'll zero it out, I guess. And then what I do is for int i equals zero and i is less than size or capacity, they're both the same at this point, then I say bigger i equals my elements i. Um, you have to do it this way by copying each individual element over. If you try to do something like bigger equals elements to like copy element contents into bigger, do you understand what that does? Like if I have two arrays and I want to copy the contents of this one into that one, that statement just makes the pointer to this one point to that one. And now I lost my bigger array and I'm still pointing at the smaller array. It's like bad, it's not good. You know, you don't want to do it that way. Um, so you have to copy the elements one by one like this. Once we're done, there's two more things that we need to do. We have now created a new array that's bigger and stores all the same contents as before. Actually, there's three things that we need to do. There's three statements missing. Tell me a statement I should add. Yeah. Good, will be elements. Oh yeah, I should delete the old array, the small array, because we don't want to use him anymore. So the little one that's 10 big, just throw it away, and I'm going to keep the bigger one now. Then what else do I need to do in addition to that? My element array should point to bigger. I'm going to use that one as elements from now on. Yes, good. There's one more thing I need to do. Yeah. I need to say capacity times equals 2, because I need to remember that I have more space. Right, exactly right. I don't need to change size, because I didn't change anything about how many elements I'm storing. So that's the resizing operation. And you can see maybe why I skipped it, because it's the hardest part of the code. Uh, all the other methods are really short and simple, and that's a little bit trickier. But that's why we came back to that later. OK, yeah, go ahead. But would you want it to start your capacity in a power of a two? I guess that's like nice mm. and neat. Yeah, you can. I mean, there's lots of people who study this, and they're like, what's the right size for one of these things? And there's a trade-off between, like, if you start it too big, you waste space for small structures. I think somebody who crunched a ton of programs found that, like, a lot of programs lists, on average, are, like, zero to three elements or something like that. It's, it's surprising that there's a lot of these teensy little lists. And so if all of them start out with 100 spots or 50 spots, or you're saying a power of two, depending on what the power of two is, you know, I don't think that it has to be a power of two, you know, whatever. I think this being times two is important, but starting at a multiple or power of two doesn't matter very much. I was just saying eight. Uh, sure. Also that it, like, looks nice. You could start with eight. You want to do eight? 
Okay, here's your eight. There. And of course, we're such good programmers, we were very careful not to write the number 10 anywhere else, right? Isn't that true? Was there any other 10s in here? No, well, 106B, but that's okay. I forgive that one. We're not switching to 86B. Uh, 10, that's it. There's no other 10s. Hey, Elements Array, are you from Tennessee? Because I'm counting your elements. And never mind, you're the only 10 I see. Um, come on, you guys haven't heard that one? Uh, whatever. So, um, so that's the, the guts of this. Okay, I want to do a couple more things real fast here. I want to talk about a particular bug that's common called the shallow copy bug. This is subtle, and I'm going to try to show you quickly. If you make one array stack, like I've done here, this is the code that we just wrote, put some stuff in there, you make another array stack, and you set it equal to the first one. So what equals operator does in general is it takes what's in the memory of this and just paste it into the other thing. So the contents of S1 will be copied into S2. Well, what are the contents of S1? A size, a capacity, and an array. And the array is built as a pointer, right? It's an int star. When I set this, S2 ends up looking like that. And what's really important is that they are both pointing to the same array. Now, why didn't it copy it? Well, remember what a pointer is. It's just writing down a memory address number. So it just copies that number over here, which effectively means they both point to the same spot, right? They're sharing an array. So now, if I set s2.push, it'll put it in there, and it'll increment the size over here. But it will, so this guy's array will be changed, but his size won't be. And basically now, really bad stuff starts happening because they're sharing the memory with each other. They're, they're, they're going to collide with each other. And the most damaging thing will be if one of these two falls out of scope, he's going to delete the array. <laughs> and the other guy's going to like try to keep using it, and then that's going to be really bad stuff happening there, right? So do you see this bug? This is a problem. And this is just like a C++ issue that comes up. It comes up in other languages, too. It's called shallow copying, a shallow copy problem. Um, OK, so that's bad. So if you want to fix this, there's a couple ways you can do it. One way is you can write something called a copy constructor, which is a constructor for an array stack that takes another array stack as a parameter. And now in here, you can write some code that actually makes a full copy of the array, makes a new array, and copies all of the other guy's elements over. And then you won't have a shallow copy anymore. You also can write an equals operator. So like, there's a difference between creating a stack with the content of another stack or setting a stack to have the same content as another stack. Those are both separate things that you need to do to handle the case of one stack being assigned to another stack. Um, so there's a kind of general principle in C++ called the rule of three. And the rule of three is if you have any memory that you allocate with, uh, uh, with new that you need to clean up in a destructor, then you probably should write these other two things as well to make sure you don't have a shallow copy bug. So it's basically like if you need any of these three, you probably need all of these three. Or you can do what I like to do, which is just say, you know, I don't want to deal with this. So you can forbid copying. <laughs> you can declare these two other things that I have on the slide a second ago, but you can declare them as being private. And that means no one's allowed to do either of those things to your class. So like, I mean, I don't know if I can demonstrate the bug very well here, but if, if main makes another stack after I do all these things, if I make another array stack s2 equals s1, I now have the bug, or I will have the bug. So if I want to not let this happen, I can go over to array stack.h and I can say, let's make a new constructor for an array stack that takes a const reference to another array stack other but let's not put that up here. Let's put that down in the private section because other people are not allowed to call the private things. Let's also write an, an operator equals that takes an array stack other. The return type of the equals operator is a reference to yourself. So I'll write both of those here and make them private. And what that'll do, if I remember correctly, is, oh, it's not called S1, it's called stack, but it, now won't compile that, and it'll say, <laughs> you can't do this. <laughs> and you might say, well, that's pretty lame. But at least, I mean, that's better than the shallow copy bug, because the shallow copy bug happily plows it forward, and then your program does horrible things. So compiler error is better than horrible things, I would argue. Yeah? Wait, so uh, uh, why 
why is it a current type of, of an equal and a reference? Oh, why is it a reference? Because you can put an equal statement as part of a larger statement, and it returns the thing on the left of the equality, which is you, the reference, the person that got assigned to. That's just a div implementation detail of the operator. Uh, yeah, question. Is the copy constructor special at all, or is it just a constructor? It's just a constructor. It's, it's kind of special. They call it a copy constructor. But the only reason it's got a special name is just that it takes the same type as the parameter. So it's not Other like than that, by any special syntax or anything. There's nothing like this. I mean, if you if you make a an array stack too, and you put parentheses stack, that calls the copy constructor. If you didn't define a copy constructor, would just just error? Um, if you didn't define one at all. Yeah, if you didn't make it private. Like that, and then you try to do that. No, see, if you don't have a copy constructor, it like does the equals or something. Like there's some kind of default. Yeah, I get a little confused about these sometimes, but like those are both valid ways to make a thing based on another thing, and it's kind of dumb stuff. But basically, you uh, you don't want to let people do that if they're going to make pointers to memory that they're going to collide with with your memory. So you don't want to let the client do that. Um, I'm out of time, but uh, if you're interested, there's also some slides in the lecture deck today about if we wanted to make this st stack able to support other types besides ints, we could make something called a template. But I'll stop and I'll uh, resume on Monday. Thanks for bearing with me through a tough week. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you guys Monday. Thanks.